But in some cases also we find a number of technical errors and I'm not going to question motives. In some cases it's deliberate distortion, in some cases it could be lack of sufficient and authentic information. This includes the following. One, erroneous translation of the Quran. As mentioned earlier, the Quran was not revealed in English. There are always problems of translating anything from one language to the other, but in the case of the Quran, grave errors will take place, and inshallah we'll see an example on that, on the issue of not taking Jews and Christians as friends. Number two, <coughs> sometimes a translation might be correct according to the dictionary, but not correct according to the, the specific Sharia meaning. Just to give you one quick example, the term people of the book, depending on the context of a specific ayah in the Quran, it could be used to refer to both Jews and Christians, in some context only to Jews, in some context to only Christian, and it's the same identical term. So without further knowledge and information, even the lexically correct translation may be wrong, because it has a specific, limited type of meaning. The third error is multi-error actually, uh, uh, four types of error that I usually love to use the term the cut and paste type of error, to use the computer language. The cut and paste type of error. You know, today with modern computers, uh, you can prove anything you want from any book you want, provided you have that technology of moving pieces and bits and putting them together can prove anything, you, you know, the most false and ridiculous thing you can prove using this. And that takes an, uh, four forms. One, to clip an ayah in the middle. Take one part of the ayah, the beginning or end, or in the middle even, and leave the rest of the ayah. And we, saw, we, we see the example about this so-called ayah to say the, the verse about the sword in chapter 9, verse 5 in the Quran. Clipping an ayah. That, sometimes reverse the meaning. Of course, Muslims are familiar with this uh, interesting example uh, when they say that you can prove from the Quran that Muslims should never pray. لا تقربوا الصلاة Not only don't pray, don't even come closer to prayer. Of course, once you read the rest, it's totally the opposite meaning. So this is لا تقربوا الصلاة type of approach, clipping. Secondly, <coughs> even if an ayah is quoted in full from the Quran, Oftentimes, it cannot be fully understood without looking into the section where it occurred. Because there is some continuity in the meaning. Not necessarily for the whole surah, but at least even for a section. Like the first 15 ayahs in Surah Al-Bara'a, Surah 9, and inshallah coming to that. So that's another pitfall. Two additional serious pitfalls. One is even if you quote a whole section, it may be misleading by itself unless you take into account other texts in the Quran as well as Sunnah that relate to the same topic. Whether that topic is Muslim, non-Muslim relation, women, ideas about peace and war, everything. Why? Because a well-known rule of interpretation of the Quran is Al-Quran yufassiru ba'duhu ba'dan. Quran explains itself. You don't clip one ayah from here, one ayah from there. What, what does the Quran say about the whole topic? Sunnah or hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu is known to be explanatory, elaborating, specifying even the meaning of the Qur'an because it is another form of revelation. So without having those texts, sometimes grave errors will take place and inshallah from the example I'm going to give you, you can... The fourth and equally serious uh, pitfall that even some Muslims unfortunately also fall into that <coughs> is to divorce it to divorce a particular ayah that may have a historical context. And once you separate it from the historical context, you might make generalization where you shouldn't make it. This might take two forms. One is the sub-science in the ulum al-Qur'an, sciences of the Qur'an, known as asbab um, al-nuzul, <coughs> or the occasion of revelation. Occasion of revelation would shed meaning, would shed light on the meaning, but we must be careful also in saying that the general rule, but there are exceptions, the general rule is that al which means that what really counts in general, with very few exceptions, is that this, the generality of the statement, not the specificity of reasons. 
And we find an example of that in the Quran, a woman coming to, to complain to the Prophet ﷺ from uh, the mistreatment of her husband, Zihar, and then an ayah come in the Quran to settle that issue. It doesn't mean that it's only for that woman or that family or that time. It's for all time to come because this was just one of the reasons Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed something in context so that people relate it and remember it properly. But what some may not realize that there are few cases where there is sufficient evidence to show that this has a specific type of application, a specific meaning. There, when there is really strong evidence to say that. I'll give you an example. In the Quran, it's speaking about people who prepare to fight against Muslims. The Quran says, الَّذِينَ قَالَ لَهُمُ النَّاسُ إِنَّ النَّاسَ قَدْ جَمَعُوا لَكُمْ فَخْشَوْهُمْ فَزَادَهُمْ إِمَانًا The text would say that <coughs> those who were told by a nas, remember the word people, that a nas have gathered an army to fight against you, but that increased them only in Iman. Now, if one were to apply the valid and generally applicable rule, al ibratu bi umum al laf, you would say that a nas here means all mankind, all mankind, from Adam to the last day. But in historical context, was it true really that all mankind from China to Allahu A'lam where were gathering to fight against Muslims? Did the people who tell the Prophet that or told the believer this were all of mankind come from China to tell them that all humankind are going to fight against you? There must be some sense here. And that's quite different from when we read in Surah Al-Hujurat that I cited, Surah 49, Ayah 13, uh, or for example in the first Ayah in Surah Al-Nisa, Ya ayyuha nasu inna khalaqnakum. That Allah is the creator of all mankind, you don't say no, this is specific. The umum, the generality here is very obvious. So again, one has to be careful in issues like that. But there's also another specific area that is more sensitive even, and I do hope that, inshallah, it would be clearly understood. If there's ambiguity, please ask me. But let me give an analogy first. When you're planting a tree before it takes root, you take extraordinary measures to protect it because it hasn't got roots yet. It's very small, very weak. So what do you notice when they plant a tree like that? They have some hay, if it's cold, to protect it from cold. And then they make robes and stake it in the ground so that the wind wouldn't blow it. But once the roots are established, you don't need those measures. And inshallah, I'm going to show in a few minutes how there were special circumstances also surrounding the emergence of Islam and hostility in the very heart of Islam and in the immediate area surrounding that required special measures otherwise Islam would have been totally wiped out. And to keep claiming that these are general things that should be applicable in any place or time is a matter that needs a much more careful analysis. But let me take some of the issues of objection they raise. First they say <coughs> that the Quran use a derogatory term to refer to those who do not accept Islam. You call them kafirs or kuffar. And say that those kafirs are going to land in the hellfire. They will be entered. And they say that this is an obvious uh, derogatory remark about people who did not wish to accept Islam. It's not very friendly. Not only this, uh, it evokes hatred and violence because the Muslim knows that, or at least is told, that those kafirs are going to the hellfire. First thing, the fact that there should be no blurring of the line between Iman and Kufr is indisputable. But is there anywhere in the Quran an authority given to the Muslim to punish the person who is a kafir? He's peaceful, but he's a kafir. He chose not to accept Islam. Is there any provision that one should punish him in this world here? None whatsoever. Therefore, we must say that a Muslim should be spiritually humble as well. And you know there's a hadith, hadith Qudsi, when somebody made a statement, Allah will never forgive that person. And Allah says in the hadith Qudsi, who is that person who's 
you know, putting himself ahead of me. I have forgiven that person and I punished you. A Muslim should be humble. And who said even that a believer who claims to be a believer or Muslim is guaranteed, can say at any point of point in his life before death that I am going to the paradise not like you kafir you know Umar radiallahu anh, in spite of his piety he says if I have one foot inside paradise and one foot outside I would have not been safe from the plan of Allah what he means here not that Allah will you know arbitrarily hashalillah punish him but that reflects piety that if a person towards the end of his life a person who has been a very good believer very good believer worshipper of Allah who knows toward the end of his life he might fall into kufr and rejection of Allah and he would be entered into paradise yet his 